I am also cognizant that my remarks may be dubbed by some as ex parte, and rightly so. But with one so involved in this very bitter dispute, what other view could be expected? I nonetheless allow the right of any who may differ to do so. But there's the rub. Of that great trial, the only remaining document is the one I hold in my hand, my two-day, 18 reign speech to the jury. For the present, let this suffice. A, a short excerpt from that address. And in my own mind, I rest assured that the historian of the future will drive the knife of critical research into the very bowels of this bogey that has been conjured forth out of the imagination of certain legal luminaries of this city. And that, my fellow students, is precisely what has occurred. Not one, but several historians with academic training have objectively viewed the entire question and, while not omitting the faults and weaknesses uh, exhibited by labor, have pronounced their several verdicts. The strike was what we said it was, a labor dispute between the building workers and the building masters, and the iron workers and machinists, boiler makers, etc., and the iron masters. It was a strike called in an attempt to establish the principle of collective bargaining, a principle, by the way, which was established in Canada shortly after the strike. Today, the machinists, boilermakers, etc., hold contracts with the same contractors whose obstinacy produced the strike. <clears throat> but they do not have contracts as machinists, boilermakers, etc., but as one union, the United Steelworkers of Canada. Now, to the trial itself. First, the early morning raids upon the homes of certain Winnipeg citizens, in which some suffered humiliation and indignities, especially some of the wives of the men arrested. I remember particularly the items. Those arrests proved to be the means whereby the strike was broken. In the case of those eight men with whom we are chiefly concerned, after a short incarceration, they were given a preliminary hearing which lasted one month, at which the Crown obtained the judicial view that a prima facie case had been established. They were then imprisoned, bail being denied, but released after a month as a result of great public protest. I must hear mention these eight. One, R. B. Russell, of the machinists, who in later years was so esteemed as to have a new school in this city named after him. Two, R. J. Johns, who later became head of manual education for the province, also a machinist. Three, John Queen, then alderman of this city and later leader of the opposition in the provincial house and mayor of this city for several terms. Four, a. A. Heaps, also an alderman of the city, later to be member for North Winnipeg in the Dominion Parliament. Five, William Irons, also elected to the Provincial House. Six, George Armstrong, carpenter and well-known socialist lecturer, also elected to the Provincial House. Seven, Roger Gray, returned soldier and speaker for and organizer of the large body of returned men who supported and sympathized with the strike. And eight, your humble sir. All but one of these were residents of Winnipeg, I being the exception. I was from Vancouver, and at the time a member of the Vancouver Trades and Labor Council, and was present in Winnipeg during the strike period for only seven days. Of these eight men, only one, R.B. Russell, had any official connection with the strike committee. Uh, Russell was, as I remember him, a, a dedicated and efficient labor official and very properly was made secretary of the strike committee. He was the only member of that committee subjected to uh, arrest and imprisonment. There was evidently such slight evidence produced in the preliminary hearing that much more was required out of which the Crown could fabricate its case. 
The charge against us at the preliminary hearing was inciting to disaffection. Quite a leap to conspiracy or sedition. So, while we were still in jail, bail being denied, during the month following the preliminary hearing, agents of the government ransacked homes, dug into basements, attics, labor and socialist halls, etc., and came up with a vast collection of literature and so-called documents. It was on this basis that the famous indictment was drawn, six counts setting out in various ways the charge of seditious conspiracy and one count of common nuisance. On our first appearance, the strategy of the Crown was made evident. They split Russell off from the rest of us by announcing that he was to be tried first and separately. From the short account I have given you, you can form your own judgment as to the reason. However, he was tried and convicted. Since the evidence in his case largely paralleled that in ours, I shall go right to our own trial. From the outset, it was apparent that the cards were stacked against us. The number of Venirimen called, for instance, twice as many for this one trial as had been called for a full assize, including the trial in this building, in the building scandal of the Roblin government. We decided to fight the best we knew all the way. And when action had been determined on behalf of one, we would all act. Thus, our first motion a change of venue on the grounds that the emotional atmosphere in the city was still highly charged and that a fair trial would be impossible. It said, a motion that Justice Metcalf should disqualify himself on the grounds that he had but recently sat as trial judge in the Russell case, that the evidence in our case would largely parallel that in the Russell case, and such evidence must still be in his lordship's mind. Denied. His lordship assured us he was doing his best to remove it from his mind. <laughs> Third, a motion, I think it was Mr. Adams, that in light of the, the huge number of Benairamen called and that we had information that all of them had been well canvassed by government police and agents opposing as insurance agents, as sewing machine salesmen, etc., we were willing to take our chances by having the first 12 called or, or 12 drawn out of a hat. This was denied, of course, since such procedure was not permitted under the law. And then came Mr. Andrews' request that the Crown, because of the nature of the case, should be allowed to call as many benirement as they wished. <clears throat> Here was a pretty picture. Not only had the Crown the usual advantage of an excess of benirement for one trial only, but asked that this move, which, which roused my Celtic blood, and in a hot denunciation of this action of the Crown, I accused Mr. Andrews of wanting to hold on to his cake and eat it too. <laughs> I think the, the public prince of that time referred to this as Pritchard's cake and eat it too. <laughs> At last, uh, a jury was selected. Well, then, uh, all farmers, good and true, I still think, but called upon to decide legally a, a, a great amount of intri intricate questions relate, relating to an industrial dispute. Twelve men, good and true. And the, the foreman of Mr. Bruce, alert and with a sense of humor and a good rolling Scotch rope. Then commenced to roll in a flood of exhibits, more than a thousand, and the cloud of witnesses that fogged up the witness box. I shall say something about these witnesses, but much more about these exhibits, for these consisted largely of those works that have come to be looked upon as socialist classics, and are even so looked upon more today than 50 years ago. Those of you who may have been sufficiently unfortunate as to have undergone the painful experience of reading my speech to the jury, I may recall that at the outset I said to these gentlemen, I am placed in a position where I have to defend the history and literature of two movements, the trades union movement and the socialist movement. 
In the explanation of the history and literature of the socialist movement, it will take you into a library which in all probability is the greatest library of any school of thought in history. Not only has the socialist movement, in the course of its development, produced itself one of the greatest volumes of literature, but it has, at the same time, in opposition to itself, created a library greater than its own. Now, I, I would like to pay tribute to all of my fellow accused, but can only mention here, and that briefly, the late John Queen. Uh, I speak of him as I would of the others, courageous and united in behalf of the workers at that time in Winnipeg. Queen and I, of those not represented by counsel, engaged to a small degree in the difficult art of cross-examination. And I can still see, mentally, the canny and slow-spoken Scott with a disarming smile upon his face, leading a witness through adroit questioning into admissions that enabled John to so tie up the learned counsel for the Crown at Andrews, Pitlado et al., with the Citizens Committee of 1000, if organized in opposition to the strike and for the purpose of breaking it. He then accused Crown Council, as spokesman for and leading members of the Citizens Committee, of engaging in a conspiracy to disturb the peace, subvert the Constitution, etc., etc. Smilingly, John said that the defense claims that Mr. Andrews, Mr. Pitlado, Mr. Sweatman, and Mr. Coyne mentioned in exhibit are the same gentlemen now appearing as prosecutors on the floor of this court. Now, remember at this time, at 1918-19, a democratic procedures had been replaced by government freedom. The right to read uh, the right of one to read what he wished or say what he thought peacefully without overt act was suddenly suspended. The country's literary life come under, came under the scrutiny of a censor, one Mr. Chambers. I would not say that his actions were of malicious intent, but they certainly sprang from a woeful ignorance. Let me... Uh, Mention some of the books, for instance, that came under this ban, with all the translated works of Marx, Engels, Kautsky, Lafargue, Morris, Bax, Babel, Liebknecht, and others, but Darwin's Origin of Species, Tyndall's Fragments of Science, Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado and Other Plays. <laughs> Remember, at this time, government action was legalized not by legislation, but by order in council, we charged with having violated, and which read in substance as follows. A certain postcard entitled After the War, published by Charles H. Kerr and Company, City of Chicago, and other publications of the said Charles H. Kerr and Company uh, that have hitherto and may hereafter be published are by order in council by virtue of the War Measures Act declared objectionable in Canada and placed under the ban. And certainly, this blanket ban upon the whole list of publications that had been and may yet be published, labor throughout the country took a definite oppositional stand. I give you, as best I can, the substance of such a resolution. Uh, whereas certain scientific and religious literature has been placed on the prohibited list, owing to regulations imposed under the War Measures Act, and whereas the war has to all intents and purposes ceased. Therefore, be it resolved that we demand full freedom of speech, press, and assembly, and advocate united action by organized labor to enforce these demands. At the risk of uh, wearying you, I shall now show what was the position of the Socialist Party uh, to which I belong. I quote from an exhibit put in by the Crown, number 846, October 15, 1918, issue of the Socialist Organ, the Western Clarion. We have always realized that the government of a people whose group interests are profoundly in conflict must of necessity be a dictatorship. In times of great national stress, and especially of war, it finds extraordinary measures of coercion necessary to ensure the success of its policy. In times of peace, these coercive measures are found neither necessary nor excusable, and the statesmen and rulers of the past whom posterity have most delighted to honor 
have generally deemed it wisest and most politic to relax this tyranny and rule with the iron hand under the velvet gloves. In view of this, we are loath to believe that any government would be so pitifully blind as to attempt to suppress this movement. We hope and trust they will not. For our desire, even more than our political opponents, uh, because we know our histories better, is for a peaceful, orderly solution of the admitted social evils of modern times. We regret the act of the Canadian government and cannot regard it as necessary. But we do not believe, yet, that its intention is to try to suppress the socialist movement and think the extraordinary measures that have been taken are taken not with a view of their permanency but as a temporary expedience of a wartime policy. The socialists claim no monopoly of the virtues. They concede to all their opponents, equal with themselves, strength of desire to abolish social ills. But they believe they know what is wrong with society, and more than their opponents think it possible to accomplish, they believe they know how to remedy the wrong, how to remove the obstruction and set the social life processes free, and from this work, they cannot stay their hand. Do you detect any wild appeal to violence in that? Or a suggestion of sedition? No, of course not. Only a plea for a hard-headed apprehension of the social problem and from such general knowledge to seek a peaceful solution. What I have read was the position of the Socialist Party of Canada in 1916. It is the position of the Socialist Party of Canada today. But the significant thing respecting this trial and that period is, of the eight men charged under this indictment, half of them, four, were then members of the Socialist Party of Canada. This, together with the fact that the main evidence produced consists, consisted of the, the literature and general propaganda of that party. We were charged and convicted not of overt acts, not even of being members of a strike committee, only one could so qualify, but for our political opinions. I come now to my vivid impressions of the chief witness for the crown, a young man with two names and two nationalities who admitted that he carried a membership in the IWW, an organization declared as unlawful, a card given to him by his superior officer. He was granted exemption from the Military Services Act. He received papers as a registered alien, an Austrian, though he had never been in Austria. So he would not be harassed by Dominion officers looking for draft evaders. His Italian name was Zanetti, his Austrian Zanetti. Why? To function as a police smart spy among both Italian and Austrian workers, especially in the coal fields. He admitted that he had lied consistently for at least nine months whenever the circumstances warranted it. He claimed to have been at meetings at which I spoke at St. George's Park and the, the Pantages Theatre in Calgary, at five in all. At these meetings, he admitted that I had spoken at length, at some as long as two hours. Yet from these more or less lengthy speeches, he extracted no more than three minutes at best. You would be justified in asking, how do you know this? I, because I got it out of him through a lengthy cross-examination. Pointing out that he had merely given a few minutes extract from a two-hour speech, I asked if he remembered me saying something like the following. Production is not undertaken for the sake of consumption, but for profit so that the man who believes that he has a good chance of improving his condition goes to work and produces without asking himself whether there is need of his product or whether he can meet the required conditions. He answered, yes, you were always saying things like that. <laughs> I then asked if he would be surprised that I had already read those words to the jury when allowed to present our view of the Crown's exhibits, that they were taken from Dr. William A. Bomber's work, Criminality and Economic Conditions. It was during the cross-examination of this witness that I was interrupted more than once, once that I still remember quite vividly. I had learned a little, uh, 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 I had learned a little of courtroom procedures by this time, and had elected to use the technique of looking at the jury while I pondered each question, and then walking right up to the witness box 
looking at the witness directly in the eye, I would flick out my question and immediately turn my back on him and await the answer. This seemed to disturb him. This fellow looked to the jury, to the Crown Counsel's table, to the, to the, then to the judge. His lordship uh, stopped me, and, and the following colloquy, colloquy in substance occurred. The court. Uh, Pritchard, uh, the witness doesn't like the way you are asking your questions. What is the matter with it? He says that you ask a question, and, and he objects. But why? He doesn't seem to like it. You turn your back on him. I can't help that. You may recall, Your Lordship, that the other day when he granted me permission to go to the law, law, law library, I came across a work on the art of cross-examination, and in that work I found this advice. One good way to conduct this is to walk slowly up to the witness box and then turn one's back on him. This is what I have done, and he doesn't like it. This authority also said, ask your questions and then walk across the courtroom and look out of the window. I have not been to the window yet. <laughs> I shall now leave Mr. Zanetti, the Italian, and his alter ego, Zanya, the Austrian. I have already mentioned the work of Dr. Bonger, Criminality and Ep Economic Conditions. I chose to bring this work to the attention of the jury, but before very long, I was again interrupted by Mr. Adams, uh, the, the Chief Crown Counsel. Uh, you know, there are so few copies of my speech to the jury extant that I am reliably informed that a year ago one might be obtained for $20, but now it seems the price has risen to $85. <coughs> I really should have insisted on royalties. <laughs> but you can find the following on pages 50 to 51 of that published speech. Uh, Mr. Andrews, uh, is this an exhibit? Uh, I'm not the father of all these exhibits here, but since you have put them in, I must use them, uh, the car. What, what is it? Uh, uh, this is an extended review of the book you were referring to. I was referring to a work by Dr. Bonger. Uh, the latest work on criminology. And, and I find there has been a written review of this uh, book in one of the Crown's exhibits by Clarence Darrow. I was merely telling the jury that some arguments there presented are found in the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> the book is not an exhibit. Uh, gentlemen of the jury, I cannot tell you what Dr. Bonger said until I discover it somewhere. I don't know who Dr. Bonger is. He is a doctor of law at Amsterdam University, and this work of his was originally written in French and then translated. I, I remember the book now. I, I don't think it is in, and the book is not in. I got a copy of the book myself. The court had displayed its erudition, and the Crown Council silenced. I took up the exhibit and read to the jury what Dr. Bonger had written. Under the capitalistic system, the greater part of the population, the part upon whose labor the entire social fabric is based, lives under the most miserable conditions. The proletariat is badly clothed, badly fed, miserably housed, exhausted by excessive and often deleterious labor, uncertain as to income and ignorance and course. Up to this point, I have been speaking of the proletariat on the supposition that he's been able to sell his labor power. But, as we have seen already, when this sale is not possible, he and his family are left to their fate. This, then, is what freedom of labor means. A freedom that the slave never knows. Freedom to die of hunger. No one guarantees to the workman or his family the means of subsistence if for any reason he is not able to sell his labor. <clears throat> the slave owner had an interest in taking care of a sick slave, for the slave represented value which he did not care to see diminished. But if a workman is sick, he is discarded and replaced by another. The sickness and death of the laborer do not harm the capitalist at all. I gave the foregoing quote to try to get the jury to see that we were charged as a crime with saying and writing what this doctor of law and criminologist 
had published. And now they must bring this address to a close. I mentioned at the beginning that I would refer toward the end of my speech to the jury form, Mr. Bruce, the gentleman with the rolling Scottish brogue and the elegant moustache. All the speeches were ended, the case given to the jury, and eventually they returned. Heaps was acquitted. Gray was found guilty only of common nuisance. The remaining five were found guilty. The prosecution had won <coughs> a spirit victory. After delivering the verdict, the foreman started to say something. That we think, my lord, that these men have already suffered. When the judge, now having his verdict, barked at them, hey, what are you trying to do? You've, you've given your verdict. Then he caught his feet. I, I should want to make a recommendation, a, a recommendation to mercy. It, it's your privilege. I don't think I shall ever forget the grim face of Mr. Bruce, as evidently shocked, he retorted, the fullest possible mercy of this court, my lord. I, I have often been asked if I feel any bitterness, and my answer, honestly, is no. The men on the other side were only doing a job for their masters. If there is any bitterness, it is against the system that produces these problems. In fact, I had the pleasant experience of meeting Mr. Andrews again in 1932. I was attending a convention of the Dominion Municipal Union held in the Royal Alexander in this city, and as the last featured speaker, I gave a talk on unemployment. And those were the days of the great worldwide oppression, and politicians everywhere were looking for ways out. <coughs> now, at this time, Mr. Andrews had a brother who was an alderman of the city and attended this conference as a delegate. The speech proved to be almost as interest-provoking as my speech to the jury some 12 years earlier. It hit the public prints and was reported over the radio at the Grain Growers Association. I remember as I came to the hotel, I was met by Bob Russell, who grabbed me and said, what have you been up to now, Bill? Your, your speech is being broadcast all over the city. He told me he had some business with Mr. Andrews and asked if I would like to go along. So we went. And when Mr. Andrews came out of his office, we engaged in a nice, friendly chat in which he said, hey, my brother, said you made a remarkable speech at the municipal convention. Well, I thanked him, and then we went on to discuss what was on everyone's mind, the, the depression, and what was to be done about it. Just a minute, sir, I said. I came here to say hello in a friendly way, but if you think I am going to give my opinions as to what I think should be done about it to the man who helped send me to jail for doing exactly that 12 years ago, <laughs> you're sadly mistaken. <laughs> He laughed and said, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> My appearance to say that I have mellowed through the years, well, one can hardly expect the fire of an ardent youth to continue to flame into what are called the golden years. <coughs> if there is any change, it is only that events throughout the world since that time have strengthened my opinion. For today, we see a world in greater chaos than even in the days of the Great Depression. The struggle for markets more intense, trade rivalries more pronounced, and all the elements appear that produced World War I and World War II, but greater in degree and now affecting the entire globe. Bourgeois society has indeed invaded all lands, nestled into all corners, made the world over into its own image, and stamped its indelible imprint upon all peoples. And the world's diplomats and politicians, its rulers and statesmen, cry, peace, peace, when there is no peace. In the early portion of this speech, I gave a, a short excerpt from my speech to the jury. If, in these, my golden years, and which I used towards the end of my speech. No more industrial rivalries, no more wars, work and peace. Whether we wish it or no, the hour has come when we must be citizens of the world or see our civilization perish. Reason, <coughs> wisdom, intelligence, forces of the mind and heart whom I have devoutly invoked come to me now. Aid me, sustain my feeble voice. Carry it, if that may be, to all the peoples of the world and diffuse it everywhere where there are men of goodwill to hear the beneficent truth. A new order of things is born. The powers of evil die, poisoned by their crime. 
the greedy and the cruel, the devourers of people, are bursting with an indigestion of blood. However sorely stricken by the sins of their blind or corrupt masters, mutilated, decimated, the proletarians remain erect. They will unite to form one universal proletariat, and we shall see fulfilled the great socialist prophecy, the union of the workers will be the peace of the world. I thank you for inviting me and for your patience in listening to me. Thank you.